Come on, who's coming to Vision Sunday on October 15th? Make some noise. Oh, come on, I need you to do better than that. 1115, you're gonna be in Vision Sunday, October 15th, make some noise. What a great day to uh, announce Vision Sunday because this isn't the first time we've had a vision. Almost 40 years ago, next year, you know it'll be 40 years as a church? 40 years next year. Uh, April will be 40 years as Oasis Church. And we would not be a church if it wasn't for in April of 1984. I was on the block in San Bernardino trying to figure my life out. And about 60 minutes west in Beverly Hills, a church called Oasis Church was being started with 10 people in a house in Beverly Hills and that church, as uh, almost all of us know, was founded by Philip and Holly Wagner in 1984. And now there's been 39 years of communicating vision, and we announced it today. And, and lo and behold, in the house today, he doesn't like a lot of attention, but I love to give it to him. In the house today, come on, somebody. My pastor, the founder of Oasis Church, is in the building today. Stand to your feet. He's going to hate this, but it's okay. Stand to your feet and give honor to Pastor Philip Wagner. Where would we be? I might still be in San Bernardino if it wasn't for you. Give God a shout of praise for the anointing. Spiritual father, leader. And, and pastor, stay, stay standing, because I might ask you to clap one more time. Listen, this might be the whole message, what this man has done for my life. I was serving in kids' ministry, and Philip came back there because I was serving in the nursery, and how I remember was he wanted to meet the, the volunteer. Everybody was calling the kids whisperer because I was just great with kids. And he took me for coffee. He, in, he invested in me, and he believed in me. I remember the very first time that I was uh, on staff, I was in kids' ministry. And he took me to uh, New York, and we went to see Joel Osteen at Yankee Stadium. And I was sitting on the field at Yankee Stadium, and I was the only one there that wasn't a lead pastor. He opened up my eyes to my calling and my purpose. And if anybody has been saved in this church, if anybody's been set free in this church, if anybody's met community in this church, it's because of the faithfulness of our pastor, Pastor Philip. So one more time. Come on, show some love. He gave a brother some hope. Thank you so much, Pastor Philip, and of course, uh, Pastor Holly, who's in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, preaching the word, and we're just so grateful, and we, we honor you so much. We love you, Pastor P. One, two, three, just say we love you, Pastor P. One, two, three. <laughs> there you go, go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. He doesn't like attention and I love giving it to him. That's just kind of always been our dynamic. It's been great. Hey, um, I wanna preach a word today. We're in a new series uh, affectionately titled, Let Him Cook. Let Him Cook, a life surrendered to Jesus. I got this because my children were watching something on Instagram and, and somebody was doing, I don't know if it's Kyrie Irving or somebody like that was doing a move and somebody in the background was le yelling, let him cook, let him cook, which basically means let him do what he is supposed to do. And I don't know if you know about this. I, I have triggers when it comes to cooking. Um, if you're the type of person who when you go to the family barbecue, you ask who made the mac and cheese, make some noise if you want to know. There's just certain things I need to know who made this, and there's certain ingredients. Um, my wife has a much more expansive palate 
than I do. So whenever she tries, I'm a very picky eater. <laughs> Uh, very picky. Well, I'm selective. Let me just not curse myself. I'm selective. And so sometimes when she wants me to try something, I'll ask her what's in this and she won't tell me because she doesn't want me to know the ingredients or the recipe because then I won't eat what was made. And I think that oftentimes we don't let God do his thing. We don't surrender to God because there are certain things in the Bible that actually have divine recipes to get certain things to come to pass in your life. I would never... Uh, put problems in the recipe of me trying to fulfill God's purpose on my life, but God sometimes allows great challenges and, and purposes, and if you're not careful, you, you actually have anxiety or you actually have fear or you actually have shame because you're trying to be God in an area where you need to surrender and yield control. Any control freaks in the house today? Make some noise if you're a control freak, which means you feel afraid if you feel out of control. And if 2020 taught us anything, we were never in control. And I, I just want to encourage somebody today that if you feel uh, somebody in your life has crippling anxiety, this series is going to be for them because we're going to unpack some things that I believe that will allow Jesus to do his best work in our lives when we surrender to him. There's certain uh, principles or, or we're uh, lovingly calling recipes in the Bible that I just find that if I had something to do with it, I would take that out. Hebrews 6, 11, 12 is one of those where it says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those through faith. We love to talk about faith, but it says through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. So there is a recipe, faith plus patience patience inherits the promises of God and how many if we were in charge of the kitchen we would pull out patience make some noise if you're in patience I I believe anybody ever said this year is my year and you've been saying it till ninth since 1997 this year uh, this word is for for you this year is 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 not uh, might not be your year this decade might be your decade can you imagine if the Lord gives you a dream and he says man I'm telling you 30 years, your life is about to be crazy. You're like, wait, what? Like sometimes we don't hear from God because we can't handle time frames and he knows that if I tell you what I have for you, you're gonna try to make it happen in November uh, when I'm gonna make it happen uh, later. I don't wanna hear God tell me later. Abraham had such a beautiful relationship with God that God could tell him a promise that was a generational promise and, and Abraham received it with joy. He took Abraham outside and said, took him outside of his tent and said, look at the stars in the sky. As many dis, uh, stars as you see in the sky is how many descendants you will have. And, and how many of us know that we, by faith in Jesus, are those descendants of Abraham. So God took Abraham outside of a tent in the middle of the, of the wilderness in like thousands and thousands of years ago and gave him a prophecy about you. Now, if that was me, I don't, I don't know if I want that kind of word. I don't want a word about what God's going to do two, three, four generations from now. I need you to do something now and today. And I want to challenge you, if your dreams and what God is speaking to you don't impact eternity or generations, you're dreaming too small. We got to be able to have a word from God, not just for today, but for the future. And allow God to shape that and, and make that however uh, he wants to do. And I have had a hard time with that recently, especially with the patience part. And so this four-week series about surrendering to Jesus, although there's a lot of ways we probably need to surrender to Jesus, but these four things we're going to touch on over the next four weeks, one of them we're going to obviously touch on today. But the first one is uh, in order to surrender to Jesus, we need to know how receptive are you to God's word? How receptive are you to God's Word. That's what we're going to talk about today. Number two, how responsive are you to God's presence? When we worship the Lord or we lift our hands or we praise God, we're being responsive to the presence of God. It's a sign that you are surrendered to him. Number three, how submitted are you to God's will? Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. That's going to be week three. And week four is going to be how passionate are you for God's house. The Bible says Jesus himself said, passion for his house consumes me. And if you know me well, um, all of these could change this week and I could preach something completely different. 
But no, I'm going to stick to him. I'm going to stick to him because I have prayed about these things. And, and the first one we're going to talk about today is how receptive are you to God's word? There is nothing more profound that has impacted my life than the word of God. Whenever I go to a room full of young people, uh, they always want to know how you hear from God. Meaning, how do you go on a prayer, a uh, place of prayer, and hear God speaking to you? And I always challenge them to read their Bibles. Because if you want to know what God is saying, you need to know what God has said. Knowing what God has said, his holy word, impacts your ability to accurately hear what he is saying. And sometimes you're in prayer and you can't hear what he is saying, but you can always hear what he said. And if you don't know what he said, which is the Bible, then you can actually misinterpret what he is saying. We need to be responsive to God's word. And, and God's word is the first thing that the devil wants you to reject. He'll have you try to accept Jesus and get rid of the word because the word is convicting, it's transformative, it changes our thought patterns in our soul and in our heart. The Bible says the word of God is alive, powerful and active, able to divide soul and spirit. That's one of the functions of the word. So when you wake up in the morning um, uh, and you are jacked up and you're stressed out, you have the emotions and the, the feeling of being overwhelmed. Anybody ever felt overwhelmed recently? The feeling of being overwhelmed comes from your soul, not from your spirit, from your soul. If you believe in Jesus, your spirit has been renewed. You have the Holy Spirit and God is never in heaven. The Holy Spirit is never saying, I'm so overwhelmed. Billions of prayers, everybody's praying, Everyone's believing, everyone's calling on my name, everyone wants to be in my presence, I just, I can't. The Holy Spirit's never doing that. But you and your soul, which is your mind, your decision making and your emotions, are going, I'm so overwhelmed. And the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm not, and you're going, I am. And then the Holy Spirit's going, but I'm not. And he's like, let me help you and then you won't be overwhelmed because I'm doing it. Do you, are you tracking with me? So then, the Bible says the word is able to dis, the, divide soul and spirit. So your soul, your emotions, what you think, what you feel, the Bible would suggest that it is constantly, it says this in Romans, saying something different than what the Holy Spirit is saying. How do you know that you're hearing from God? Number one is people who don't know God would be eminently disagree. Like, that's the one clue. Like, there's nobody in the world that's going to go, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yeah, I was reading in Ezekiel the other day, and the Lord said this. And somebody who doesn't know the Lord goes, Ezekiel, we love that guy. No, it's, it, it's that's not what's going to happen. That usually disagreement from people who don't know the Lord, like, usually is a good sign that God might be speaking. Because God would never tell you to do something that you were already going to do. The word of the Lord is in conflict with our own human desires. That's why we need the word, the Bible says, to separate soul and spirit. So then now when you're a believer who has actually been embracing, listening to, and reading God's word, when you wake up in the morning and feel overwhelmed the, in your soul, the word of the Lord separates your soul from your spirit and your spirit. Spirit says, the Lord is my shepherd. He gots me. I'm good. He'll give me new strength, new vision, new hope, and new peace while your soul is screaming, quit, give up. You're overwhelmed. Matter of fact, it should be impossible to accomplish the will of God with just your human nature. We need a divine nature, and the word helps kick in the divine nature that God has put in each and every one of you. What good is it to be made in the image of God if we don't use the image of God to accomplish the will of God? What good is it? We're all made in the image of God. And so this verse we're going to read is from the book of Ezekiel. Say, oh shoot, he's going in Ezekiel. Dang, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36 verses 25 through 27. And there was a couple of prophets in the Old Testament, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And they were prophets that God raised up for a specific purpose. That, that God's people had rejected God's word. 
And Ezekiel and Jeremiah had this responsibility of realigning God's people to God's word because their rejecting God's word took them out of the promised land, literally. The promises of God had been forfeited because they had rejected God's word. Now, you might be in this room thinking, well, maybe that's why things are crazy in the world because the world is rejecting God's word. That's not true. That's not what's going on. And you may have heard that, but that's not this context. This context is that Moses was raised up by God. God's people were enslaved in Egypt, and God raised up Moses to set God's people free. Most Bible scholars agree that Moses was like a picture of Jesus. He was like the precursor to Jesus. Egypt was the precursor to what sin would feel like. We're in slaves to sin, and God was using Moses and the testimony of Moses, setting God's people free as a prophecy, if you will, of what Christ would come once and for all by his shed blood on the cross. He would set you free from sin. He would set you free from the control of the devil, and you would enter in and be a son and daughter of God. And the Bible says those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons and daughters of, of God. And so God used Moses to set these people free. But God did not give them not one law in Egypt, not one rule. He just set them free. And the Bible says they all get out of Egypt. They're blessed. They have a bunch of Egypt stuff. And then they get to a place called the wilderness, and God gives them a revelation of where they're going. They're going to the land of Canaan. He gives them a prophecy. I have promises for you. This is what I'm going to do for you. This is how I'm going to lead you. This is how I'm going to bless you. And then he gives them rules and regulations and laws and the Ten Commandments to do what? to help them get to the promises of God and to help them sustain the promises of God. That's why he gives them to them. And what did they say? They said, all these things we will do. And what happens is when God gave them the law and they agreed, it created what's called a covenant. And they had to obey it to get the promises. He didn't just dump the truth out to culture and say, this is my word. And they didn't have a revelation of who he was. They never saw a sign and wonder. They never saw, read uh, Deuteronomy 11, where the Bible says that God tells the, the older people not to tell their children about the decrees and the laws yet. It says, because they haven't seen me move. And I'm paraphrasing. Read Deuteronomy in 11, 12. He goes, I'm holding you accountable to my word, my laws, and my regulation because you were there when I parted the Red Sea. You were there when I took the chariots in there. You were there when I gave you manna in the wilderness. Read Deuteronomy 11, 12. It says, because you were there, I'm holding you accountable. But don't tell your kids about the word of God and you haven't told them about me. They don't know me. They haven't seen me move. So for some of you, if it's your first Sunday in church and you feel beat up by church culture telling you you're a sinner, you need to obey, those things are true, but that's not what they should be telling you. You will get there. They just told you early, right? If you, somebody said to you, you want to go to a concert tonight? They go, sure, Beyonce, Renaissance, tonight. And you get to the stadium and you find out that the concert is in a month, you have the right to be mad at that person because they told you something really good early. And so, yeah, we're all sinners. Yeah, you have something in your life you need to change. But God himself did not tell them a revelation of his truth until they had a revelation of his presence. You, you got to catch this. The Bible said that God put Adam and Eve in the garden and then told them, not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He put them in an atmosphere to tell them the truth. So as believers, what are we? We are so filled with the Holy Spirit. We are the light of the world. What is God prophesying to you and I? He's like, I'm making you receptive to my word, and then you're going to be a light because you live the word. And when you go into Starbucks to tell somebody the truth, you've already created the atmosphere to tell the truth in. If you're angry and frustrated and mad and you tell the truth, that is not the atmosphere. The atmosphere is my presence. The atmosphere is my love. And so God had this profound problem because he kept trying to tell Israel what to do and they wouldn't do it. 
And so he raised up these two prophets because these guys are all in exile now. And, and he says something interesting in Ezekiel 36. I love God. God is so amazing. He's so gracious. He says this, Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And he's saying this because at the time, one of the rituals of the priest in that uh, tabernacle temple system was to sprinkle water. They did certain things that symbolized that you were clean from your sin, but you never really were because Jesus had not yet been sent. And so Ezekiel is giving a prophecy that Jesus is about to do permanently what priests and pastors are doing temporarily. Can I tell somebody something today? If you don't surrender to Jesus and allow Jesus to make permanent, then what happens on the Sunday service is temporary. I'm just sprinkling water. But it, Jesus is the one who makes it permanent. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives you permanent conviction. You ever felt something in church that you don't feel anywhere else? Right? Some of us, we, we don't understand that God's presence is here and he gives us a new heart if we would just be more aware of it. You, fa you follow what I'm saying? Some of us won't cuss in front of our grandmother. But we, we cuss in front of Jesus because we don't realize he's there. So it's elevating Jesus and his presence so we can be more responsive. And Ezekiel gives a process. I'm gonna, God's going to do this himself. You're not going to need pastors to sprinkle water on you. You're not going to need priests to speak. Uh, sprinkle water on you. Not, no disrespect to other religions where the priest does that, but he's saying, I'm going to do that personally. You will not need a human to endorse you. I will endorse you personally through repentance and faith. I will cleanse you of your sins. And then he goes, I'm going to cleanse all of your idols. I'm going to get rid of all that too. And then he says, I'm going to give you a new heart because it is your janky, disobedient, trifling heart that's part of the problem and so he doesn't say go fix it he says I'm gonna give you a new one and he goes okay if they have a new heart that means they're tender and they're responsive but they but I need to make them more spiritual and then he goes I'm gonna give you a new spirit God's doing all of it and he says and I will remove your heart of stone there's so many people in God's house today that have a heart heart and you need to know that some of that stuff is not your fault your hard heart was a protective measure because you were abused or you were done wrong and our heart begins to harden to make sure that nothing bad can come in but also nothing good can come in and so God needs to soften your heart not so that all those people can hurt you again so that God can deposit his beautiful word in a soft heart so he says, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, which means a tender and responsive heart. And this is my favorite part. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. I will cause you to do that. God himself will give you his Holy Spirit, a new heart, a new way of thinking, and it will cause you. So when we see people disobeying God's word, it's because they have not yet got this new heart and this new spirit, because if they had, that would cause them to listen to God. Do you know that you have something that is causing you to listen to God? This is why it's so dangerous for us to act like we got it all together. That we just figured it out. I've been a Christian for 50 years. I've been a Christian for 60 years. I got it all figured out. No, that's the Holy Spirit. Do you know who I would be if God had not given me a new heart? Stop taking credit for what God is doing. We all know where you would be. Come on, we all know. That without God, who would we be? The Bible says that our righteousness is filthy rags to God. It is the Lord that has made me gracious. It's the Lord that has made me kind. It's the Lord that has given me vision and dreams. It's the Lord that is my peace. That's God. It isn't my routine and my regimen. You have people that are trying to get charge you money to give you a routine that they do so to have peace, and it's Jesus that gives you peace. It's his word that gives you peace. It's not me. 
It's not me. The Lord has given me a new heart and a new spirit. And this is the promises of God. Do you know in sermons where we talk about the promises of God, I think we all, if we're honest, think about material things. If I got up here right now and went, man, the Lord has promises for you. He's going to end the strike. You're going to book more auditions than you've ever booked. And your account is going to have millions of dollars in it. Somebody shout to the Lord. He's going to bless your business. I'm joking and people are raising their hand trying to receive it. <laughs> Somebody in the back went, I was, I would like, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> Lord, give me a new heart and give me a new spirit. When's the last time we asked for that? That's not on my prayer list. We get, I want to, I need a new way of thinking. I need a new way. I need something new to happen on the inside of me. That doesn't make it on our prayer list. You know why? Because God will give it to us. And the devil's like, please don't ask for that. Keep asking for the stuff that your soul cannot handle because I know that God won't give it to you. But if you ask for a new heart, it comes with blessing. Because later in this verse, if you read Ezekiel, he says, after he does all this, I will cause the grain to come. They're believing for their crops because they were all farmers. So their provision was grain. Anybody believing for crazy provision and crazy finance? In the Bible, that would symbolize the grain. And he says, I will cause your heart to be responsive to my word, and I will cause the grain in harvest time to be, I will make it happen. And so what happens is we, we, we don't ask God for that. We don't ask God for a new heart. We don't ask God for a new spirit. We ask God for the stuff that only a new heart and new spirit would get us, and we want to bypass the recipe. I don't want any problems. I, wanna, I don't want any challenges. I don't want to go through the fire. But the recipe for a cake is useless if you don't put it in fire. Try to eat the ingredients of a cake by themselves. No, it is the mixing together and the fire that makes it edible. So we have to understand that God wants to give us a tender and responsive heart. And he says, I'm going to remove your sin. And I want you to, this is going to be a tough one. Just turn to your neighbor and say, hey, man, he's about to get real. So get ready. Just turn to your neighbor and say, he's about to get real. About to get real up in here. That's why I wore the Jesus loves you hat because I'm about to tell you some, some truth. So if you start to feel a certain type of way, just look at my hat. <laughs> Jesus loves you. God wants to remove your sin. The devil wants you to redefine sin. He, I am going to say it again. It's three times if I have to. God wants to remove your sin. The devil wants you to redefine it. He wants you to decide through some new theology. All of a sudden, every scholar for 2,000 years has got it wrong. And you at 24 knows exactly what sin is and what sin is not. Uh, Pastor Philip and Holly, they don't know what they're talking about. Me? Do you know, I, I went on the internet for 35 minutes and everyone who's come before me has gotten it wrong. This is not a sin. And why does the devil want you to do that? Why? The devil wants you to do that because he wants you to look for a place of acceptance with people who are sinners. And he wants to create a community of people who do what you do. Because he knows community is the way so, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is what, like, like this is going to sound bad, but I, this is where I was at. When I was smoking weed, a lot of it, I never asked God for forgiveness for smoking weed, never repented, because I searched the Bible and I was trying to make sure that it wasn't a sin. Like, and, and if you search with the idea that it's not a sin, you'll find it. So I found the book of Genesis, and there's this girl, Rachel and Leah, um, had been given mandrakes in the Bible. And mandrakes, when I looked it up, were in the Bible, and, and they, they gave a gift of mandrakes. And mandrakes, if you had the, 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 ate the root, it was the same effect as a weed brownie. It was a hallucinogen. And I said, see, there's nothing wrong with it. Because they gave mandrakes to each other as a gift, and I used that. 
Do you see how stupid that is? If you want to do something, you can make the Bible say what you wanted to say. I remember one time I preached Peter stepping out of the boat and somebody came to me and said that I just quit my job, man. When you was talking, the Lord said, step out of the boat. And then came and asked the church for help with their rent a month later. We say, the Lord told me to step out of the boat. But that's not what that verse means. The Bible says Peter stepped out of the boat and he sank. Not God bless. <laughs> Gagging on water. <laughs> Jesus, help me. <laughs> and he reached out to Jesus. And Jesus helped him get back to the boat. <laughs> the Bible says they walked back to the boat together and the storm stopped. So the reason why Jesus is telling you to step out of the boat is to go find Christ and bring him back to the boat and the boat you're in, the storm will stop if you go get Jesus. That's the meaning of the verse, not to quit your job. But if you want to redefine something, you can make the Bible support it. There were certain pastors in the 1800s that saw Bible verses and condoned slavery. You can make it say what you want it to say. That if, if you're not, if you want it to say that, you'll find a way for it to say that. And so when you're redefining sin, this is why this is so profoundly dangerous. Because the Bible says, and I feel like I got a word from the Lord. Do you know the Bible says where sin increases, grace increases? So whenever there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of grace. I mean, we could fill this room with sinners and God's grace would overwhelm the room. But if we don't say it's a sin then it cuts off the grace. So the devil knows this. The devil knows the Bible more than you. He tempted Jesus with the Bible. So when he's telling you it's not a sin, it's because you're, he, say, he knows God wants to give you grace, but you don't get grace for what you want to do. You get grace for what you don't want to do. Paul said, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. Thanks for the grace of God, if it wasn't for the grace of God. So, so the key to receiving grace is I don't want to do it. Wow. So when I received grace for the marijuana, it's when my heart became responsive to his word. And so I could say with every time I smoked, I don't want to do this. Not, it's fine. Every, nobody's perfect. But sometimes you just in God's presence and you just pounding tequila shots and smoking. Lord, I don't want to be so dependent on this stuff. Lord, rolling your blunt. I don't want to be dependent on this stuff. The Lord, the grace of God expands in your life. So the enemy wants you to redefine sin so you can be cut off from grace and every person who's cut off from grace will never be happy in their soul. So when the world is getting more sinful, tell me one person that you've seen on Instagram say God's grace is increasing. When they bring up how much sin is in the world, give me one person who said, and God's grace is increasing. I mean, we're talking about the truth, right? So whenever you see sin in the world, just say to yourself, and God's grace is increasing. If I can just get them to say, I need Jesus to give me a new heart. Then the grace expands. This is not about what y'all do or don't do. Young people, don't let anybody judge you. The God wants to give you grace. He gave me so much grace. I was a wild man. And God gave me grace because I took that into his presence and said, Lord, I, I want a new heart. I stayed on this point really long because that's how you get cut off from grace is when you redefine it. And the Bible says, by the way, the church loves to pick two or three things and goes, those are the big sins. But you know, the Bible says anything done apart from faith is sin. I mean, whatever area in your life is not faith driven, that's sin because it's selfish ambition. It doesn't come from the Lord. The second thing that God has said he's going to do is he's going to remove our idols, the things that we desire more than God or the things we think we couldn't live without or an object of our passionate Devotion. He says, I'm going to cleanse you of your sin and I'm going to get rid of your idols. If I, don't, if I can't figure out what I would do if I wasn't a pastor preaching on Sundays, it's an idol. If I got a girlfriend and all oh, my life is over if I don't have her, that's an idol. 
If I got a boyfriend, that's an idol. Anything that gets more devotion from us than Christ is an idol. Some of us pursue our dreams more than we pursue his presence. It's an idol. And why would God give you somebody or something to replace him with? He, all right, I gotta unpack this. How much time I got? 37 seconds, Lord, you gotta help me. In the Bible, there was this idol that Israel had built um, called Dagon. Not Israel, but like the Philistines. They built this called Dagon, and it was an idol, and they thought it was God. And so they got a hold of the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God. This was God. Ark of the Covenant was God. The idol Dagon was not God. And so they were like, cool, we got Dagon and God. And the Bible says they put this statue, Dagon, next to the Ark of the Covenant, and when they came in the morning, Dagon was on the ground. So they said, oh, that's interesting. So they picked it up and they put it right next to God. And this time when they came in the morning, the thing's feet were cut off, the, the head was off, and the, and the thing was ruined because they put it next to God. Some of us are waiting on God to do something and there's a dream or there's something that is in our life and it's in ruins, not because it wasn't God's plan, but every morning we put that thing right next to the Lord. And we wake up in the morning and it's destroyed, not because it was off or wrong, but because it got a little bit too close to the Lord. Is there something that you think you're praying about, but if the Holy Spirit convicted you and showed you right now, you're actually praying to it? Wow. Not about it. To it. You can't live without it. If God doesn't give it to you, you'll reject him, his word, and everything else. He's like, I got to get rid of sin, and I got to get rid of idols. Why? This is not because God is some angry, mad God. God gave Jesus all his wrath. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to get them back to the promised land. This is not about making God happy. God's happy. Jesus made God permanently happy and joyful. God is not mad at you. But this is how you remember your soft, responsive heart to God's word is how you get to the promises of God and how you sustain the promises of God. Does that make sense? So God's trying to bless you. He gets rid of your, your idols. And then um, if you keep going, and I'm going to have the team come up. He goes, uh, I'm, I'm going to get rid of your sin. I'm going to get rid of your idols. I'm going to give you a new heart, and I'm going to give you a new spirit. God says he's going to do all of this. Do you know how good God is so far None of it's on you. None of it is on you. None of it. The Holy Spirit within you, you're a vessel for the Holy Spirit. None of this is on your human will. You don't make a choice for Christ. Not in your human will you don't. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of you or on you or in this room nudging you towards Jesus to do what he wants. Without him, you wouldn't. The Bible says the wisdom of God is foolishness to people that don't know God. So God's got to be able to tell you something that sounds crazy. Tell you something in his word that doesn't make sense to nobody else or doesn't make sense to culture. But because of the Holy Spirit, you say, I receive that. He wants to make your heart tender and responsive to God's word. And I'm grateful that the church has done a great job making people tender and responsive to his presence. That's what this does. We have some of the best musicians and worship leaders and communicators. And so when you're in God's presence, yeah, you lift your hands. But what happens when you're by yourself and God gives you a word? I need you to forgive that person. I need you to stop being offended all the time. I need you to stop making everyone submit to your triggers and you submit to the word. I'm about to. That's, I, I'm telling we put language to it. That's my trigger. I get it. You got to get rid of that trigger. You got to go, we got to get rid of that because it's binding you up and God wants to set you free because he's trying to bless you. And here's what's cool about this. In Acts chapter two, it says in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Not the good people, not the bad people, not the church people. I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's what God is trying to do. And here's what's cool. When he does that, it, it, it gives your heart ability to respond in God's word. I would, I would recommend that you never...
never spout the truth to someone who has not yet gone through the process of having a new heart and a new spirit. It's, it's a waste of time. Ask God and pray for him to give them a new heart and, and a new spirit. And here's what happens. The Bible says that Jesus' word often represents seed and our hearts represent soil. Have you ever heard this concept in the Bible that you reap what you sow? Anybody believing in this next season that they're gonna reap what they've been sowing? I am. Some of you have been working hard. Some of you have been doing a lot of great things in your life. Some of you, um, and I believe, and I'm believing for you that, that what you're gonna reap is right on the other side of what you've been sowing. But I caught this in scripture as I was preparing for this word and I've never realized this before. Not only can you reap what you sow, the Bible says press down, shaken together where there's not room enough, which is why I don't sow judgment because I don't want to reap judgment, press down and shaken together. I want to sow grace and I want to sow mercy and I want to sow that because that's what I want to reap. But not only can you reap what you sow, the Bible says this in Matthew 13, 23. This will be the most blessed season you've ever had in your life if, if you get this. Matthew 13, 23. The seed. What does the seed represent? God's word. That fell on good soil. What's the soil? My heart. A responsive heart that God says he wants to give it. What's the seed? It's the word. What's the soil? It's my heart. It says the, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times more than what was sown. So not only do you reap what you sow, you reap what he sows. And a season where a church is reaping what we sow, they're also reaping the word that God sows in your life. Do you know the blessing that you could have if you reap what you sow, but you're also reaping what he sowed? He, Jesus, wants to sow the word of God in your heart. So a harvest or an increase or the amazing blessings that you're praying for comes from a heart that is producing a harvest from God's word and a life that's producing a harvest from the things we put our hands to. And those two things come together to make the most blessed church and sons of daughters the world has ever seen. And then we go into all the world with the light of Jesus shining in our face, telling them not to beware of the water because it'll drown you. That's sin preaching. But to beware of the lifeguard who will save you. That's Jesus. You get the difference. If, if you... In the world, if you were drowning in the ocean and had to be rescued by the lifeguard, you would come on the shore and tell everyone not to go in the water. That's what we would do in our humanity. And Jesus is asking us to do the opposite. We're supposed to come on the shore and tell everybody about the lifeguard, because guess what? Everybody's gonna get in the water, you can't stop them. But when they do, salvation comes only one way, and that's Jesus. Stop preaching and sharing about the water and start preaching and sharing about the Savior because every human, we're all born into sin. We're all going to get in the water. We're all going to drown in sin in our own way. And only Jesus saves. The Bible says only by one name can we be saved. And I want to apologize if all you've heard about is the water. No, 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 no. There's a Savior, Jesus, who wants to give you a heart that's responsive to his word and the spirit that you're led by. And this, my friends, is Christianity. A new heart and a new spirit. Not new year and new you. No, a new heart, new spirit. A dead you and now an alive you. I want you to stand to your feet because I want to pray for somebody today. And you need the Lord to do this in this season of your life. And you're saying, man, Like low key, I'm trying to be a, 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 a sous chef for Jesus. I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm in the kitchen chopping up onions, crying, because I'm trying to do his job. I, I need a new heart. I, I need a heart that's responsive to God's word. I need a spirit that helps me live the life I'm supposed to live. I, I need the Holy Spirit. And you get this because you put your faith in Jesus and Jesus um, shed his blood on the cross, dying for your sins so that you could receive forgiveness and grace and then the Holy Spirit the Bible says fills you and the Bible says the Holy Spirit leads you to the truth there's not a truth telling it's a truth leading 
truth, biblical truth, you need to lead someone to it, not shout it, not tell it. When they were rebuilding the temple, we are in a season of rebuilding God's house and God's church. And in the book of Zechariah, when they were rebuilding God's house and God's church, and people from all over Jerusalem were coming to the temple of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah and said they were rebuilding the temple and they were shouting grace. They were shouting grace. They weren't shouting truth. Truth is important. They were shouting grace. And it says they rebuilt the temple with shouts of grace. So the enemy wants to shout about your sin, but you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as the church, our job is to build you in your faith with shouts of grace. And you get a new heart and a new spirit. And then the Holy Spirit leads you to the truth. Christians, we got to stop shouting truth and start shouting grace so that someone can get a new heart and a new spirit and the Holy Spirit will lead them to the truth. And when Jesus said that, he said this, and I believe he's saying it to you today. He said to his disciples, there's so many things I want to tell you, but your souls can't bear to hear it now. But I will send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and when he comes, he will lead you into the truth. So as believers, when we see all the craziness in the world, we got to say, there's so many things I want to tell you, but your soul can't bear to hear it. But if you would let Jesus give you a new heart and a new spirit, the spirit would show up and lead you to the truth. Jesus said, there's so many things I want to tell you, but your soul can't handle it. When, as truth tellers, we're supposed to be measuring, can your soul handle what I'm getting ready to tell you? And so this is the opportunity that I want to give you. I want you to give your life to Christ. I really believe that you will, but more importantly, God wants you to come home, and here's why. Because he'll give you a new heart and give you the Holy Spirit, and then God can use me to preach the truth, but the Holy Spirit will lead you to the truth of God's word. But you can't have that if you don't have a new heart that comes through repentance and faith in Jesus. And so maybe you're in this room and the enemy's been trying to make you define sin so that grace can't overwhelm you. Or maybe you were a believer and you, um, uh, you know, want to come back and maybe you fell away and you would consider yourself like a prodigal son or a daughter and you want to come the Lord. You just want to receive Jesus today as the worship team leads right now. I just feel like God's going to put on somebody's heart to come receive Jesus. And I want to invite you to the front right now to just come forward. Just come forward if you say, I want to give my life to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I need mercy and grace and the love of Jesus. I'm coming forward to receive my salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Give a great big hand clap for those coming forward. We thank you, Jesus. Come on, brother. We thank you, Lord.